everyone, to everyone listening, thank you for taking the time. I hope this will be interesting. So I'll go ahead and, and just kind of give a, a short agenda on what I plan to speak on today. So really quickly, um, in a nutshell, I would like to uh, just kind of reiterate why, uh, what kind of limitations and bottlenecks uh, well, we're all pretty much aware of in, in the space, but uh, also specifically what that meant for us with our experience and how we approached the problem. And then what kind of things we've been building um, to circumvent the problem in that sense. And then finally, like I said, some questions and answers are, are uh, if, if needed, uh, there's some, some room for that as well. Uh, so I'll go basically in, the, in a quick short overview of what kind of limits we're talking about here uh, specifically to when it comes to blockchains. And um, yeah, so probably everybody kind of is aware of these, but I think it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense to reiterate. Um, and uh, really kind of in a basic, most basic way, uh, when we look at the ledgers and the decentralized ledgers that, that blockchains really uh, support, uh, they're there to keep score on value transactions. Obviously, we have other things uh, working there now as well. So uh, smart contracts are kind of the immediate successor of uh, the, 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 the kind of the blockchain 1.0 narrative. And then we actually have, you know, abilities to store some additional data and computation. Um, and there's tons of great research in the space, but essentially the way it all started was, you know, to keep score and, and the transaction is in the end the, the kind of the, the core tenant or, or basically the, the, the first class citizen of the chain. Everything happens within a transaction. And um, this is a quote I found on, on Hacker Noon. Um, I think I didn't, I didn't put in the, the quote link, but I'll try to do that later. Uh, basically, the problem that uh, the scalability uh, uh, presents comes packaged with the chain. So blockchain is trusted and secure because exactly it is a bottleneck. So you cannot just go ahead and increase scalability. You can change parameters in the chain. You can play with them. But um, if you overplay, let's say like that, if you go too far, um, you lose some of the main core value propositions that blockchain is there uh, to provide that we're all so excited about in the industry. Um, and turns out that a big part of this issue is really physics. So. Um, not to go too deep into it uh, from the physics side of the view, uh, but really uh, just kind of an illustration. Um, it takes time for things to propagate through a network. And if we look at, for example, Bitcoin specifically, the average block propagation time is kind of around 10 to 15 seconds, sort of 14 seconds is the, the, the latest um, number I found online, but essentially the, the point is not in precision of how many seconds. It's really that it takes some time to send uh, a block throughout the network. And because it's not instantaneous, because, uh, well, we, we don't have limitless, uh, you know, throughputs of internet connections. And that's very visible today in this uh, unfortunate situation where uh, we're basically a lot of us are working from home and the internet is very strained. Uh, situation where I'm, I'm not sure if, if you guys are aware, but even the, here uh, in Europe, the European Commission has asked um, the, the video streamers like Netflix to lower the, the high definition uh, streaming to, to standard definition so the internet doesn't break, essentially. Well, um, in, in, in having this in mind that the, the actual physics problem is that no matter how much we play with parameters or innovation we introduce, uh, we cannot go faster than, well, the speed of light, or we cannot like go faster than the internet can go uh, at this moment in time. So what, what it really uh, turns out to be is that if you want to try to go faster, you have to try to do something. Like, uh, for, for example, in Bitcoin, you have about 10-ish thousands of nodes that are all needing to, to get consensus. And consensus over an entire network has enormous costs. Over, over any proof of work network, especially because we're all pretty much aware how much um, uh, it's, it, it, it actually costs to mine uh, on a single machine. And rather than that, how much the, the entire network costs. And there's not just the, 
um, monetary costs associated to it, but obviously tons of environmental costs. And I won't go that way. I'm sure everyone's pretty much aware of that. But it's it's kind of interesting when you zoom out a bit and you realize why. And it, it's because it's really uh, the consensus costs tons of tons of uh, cash to, to do in such a way that we're doing it. And this way, uh, the public blockchain proof of work way is really um, that every node in the network has um, the ability to validate uh, what's going on in the network. So then basically they need to get the, the block, they need to process it. Um, all of this has to take some time. And because of this limit, you can increase the block size, but you know, you're not gonna change the limit. You're gonna have a bigger block you know, going through the network with the same sort of throughput and then it takes longer. Or um, what you can do is uh, you can uh, you can do many different tweak, tweaks with the, with the whole uh, network and I'll briefly touch upon that, but essentially the physics, we, we haven't learned yet how to change. So what happens is if you want to specifically look at the data storage problem, a lot of people I think still are trying to um, store too many things on the chain and um, it's already a pretty big challenge especially when we look at public blockchain so if you look at ethereum so one kilobyte of data is kind of constantly around one dollar and uh, just really kind of from the perspective of how much that costs it it's really it doesn't seem so big but if you go up to a megabyte which is a little hard to, to fit in uh, in a transaction on ethereum uh, but you know you're you're kind of in the realm of thousands, um, and and it's okay. And uh, what what I'm trying to kind of point out is that it's fine. It's it's not designed to do that. So blockchain um, is is great for certain things, and especially in the context of trust. But in order for us to confuse it with databases, uh, that that would be a kind of a, a an error, and that's why uh, there's quite a few really interesting solutions that obviously store data off chain. Uh, one of them is Swarm. I think Victor is speaking later. Victor Tron from Swarm, uh, really really impressive project, and and uh, really uh, I'm excited to, to to see his talk. I've seen him speak before in conferences, and um, and their work has been really really amazing um and it's really hard i i know uh, from from what we've been working on we've touched on uh, upon some problems that they are trying to solve within swarm uh which is uh for for those of uh, you who might not know uh but basically a peer-to-peer -peer decentralized storage uh as part of the ethereum ecosystem um of, of the original three projects including whisper and the idea uh, obviously is to um, do uh, basically hash addressing of, of data chunks on the, on, the, on, the, on the network. So basically it's not a consensus network. Uh, but but the, the whole idea there is obviously not, not new. So uh, storing data off chain on it, but still in a decentralized scenario uh, makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, but specifically for chains, we've seen what, what we can do to yeah, get some more throughput out of them is like, going multi-chain or sharding and I'm pretty sure everyone in, in the ETH uh, world knows about 2.0 and what approaches are taken there and I would argue it's because we are well we're not able to circumvent physics that's kind of the most simplest answer I know I'm oversimplifying it to a degree but uh, it, it I think it suffices and uh, so basically when we look at Ethereum we're going to have a lot of different chains that uh, work together somehow in in some uh, amazing magical way with with uh, the beacon chain, um, and then we have Cosmos, which does uh, something similar with uh, another uh, little different multi-chain approach. Uh, another option would be, well, you can go and lower the number of validators. There's there's been chains that um, have been doing this. So instead of like having a, a, um, a, a everyone really validate everything, you have a small number of validators, small is an arbitrary term so that depending on the network i won't go into into any specifics here but essentially that means there's less of nodes in the network that need to be reached so physics is less of a problem let's say and therefore you can get some more throughput but then also you get into other troubles and the biggest trouble then is that when you have a low number of validators 
uh, you kind of lose on the value proposition of blockchain, which is the decentralization. And you, you, you kind of um, go away from, um, you know, the, the, the narrative, at least, that everyone can participate in consensus. Uh, now, again, we all know that uh, uh, mining pools exist and that, that, that all these things are there to, um, to kind of um, um, make this uh, situation not as black and white as I'm portraying it here. But um, these are just some of the approaches uh, how, you know, we can get more throughput, right? And then we can batch things. We can batch transactions in rollups. Uh, Plasma was a really good idea uh, as well. Um, quite a few experiments happened there. Um, um, so, so that was another approach. And uh, there's kind of a fourth option that uh, I highlighted for. There's, there's probably more, but like the, the one that we actually uh, prefer the most is actually really minimize the use of the chain. And uh, you want to try to maintain the centralization. So use, a, use an off-chain network for, for what's really non-critical to be on the chain. Uh, but still use the ultimate most trusted chain you can. And, um, and in that sense, when you look at it from that perspective, if you're not trying to utilize blockchain as the be all end all silver bullet for everything, but rather as uh, one key block in, in the, the novel solutions that we like to call the Web3, uh, but really I believe everything uh, will, will at some point in the near future have a component that, that needs to incorporate this trust which blockchain will bring. Um, if we look at it from that perspective, then uh, then um, it, it makes a lot of sense to just minimize the use of it. And then the, the actual limits of scale, if we design around them, so if we're not looking for speed uh, or, or if we're not looking for, you know, putting uh, tons of data in, in an immutable store forever, because just to reiterate that point, if you have thousands of computers on, on a network and they all keep the whole chain, which is tens and hundreds of gigabytes, depending on which chain, and they all have to keep a copy of your one kilobyte transaction that you sent essentially forever, uh, obviously that has to cost a lot. That's why we're talking in terms of one kilobyte for one dollar. So um, yeah, we, we believe that uh, marrying this new world of trusted and uh, um, a, a sort of a mixture of it with the old world of uh, using the technologies that are already proven in certain areas, that it's going to work really well. And um, I'm actually going to explain how we approach this. Um, so who are we just to introduce myself really quickly and, and uh, my team. So uh, we are uh, actually Trace Labs. We're a company that has spawned the Origin Trail ecosystem and Origin Trail um, actually being a project from already from 2013. Uh, so we've been working on supply chain issues specifically and our slogan is to ma uh, making supply chains work together. Um, I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper into this, um, so, uh, but really quickly to, to reiterate on, on what, kind of, um, uh, what kind of problems we're trying to solve and then, then I'll explain how we went about them and what we learned on the way. Um, essentially, we're looking at really specifically supply chains and um, I know they've been put in context of blockchain quite, quite often. Um, it, it's like the killer app, right, for blockchain. Um, well, I'd, I'd argue that um, not entirely, not blockchain alone. Uh, we need additional tools, and but the blockchain is a very uh, key component in, in the, the problem solving that, uh, that I'll try to explain hopefully well today. So what we're looking at is a slide that illustrates kind of a very generic supply chain where we have uh, someone from like a primary producer, that would be a farmer, a processing facility. So that would be maybe your dairy producer, some distribution, warehousing, and then in the end, the retailer. That's where you as a shopper go and, and purchase your product. And for example, here in, in, in Europe and EU specifically, there's a specific requirement that every company along this chain needs to conform to uh, certain traceability standards. This standard basically says that every company needs to know what happened the step before them and a step after. So that's uh, that means if I am uh, the, the warehouse uh, in this example, I need to know who is my distributor, which makes a lot of sense because they distribute to my warehouse, and then I know who I, I need to know the retailer who I 
how to sell this too, right? So, and not only do I need to know this, I need to keep record of this. That's that's kind of the whole idea. So, the, uh, the, the problem there is that nobody really has the visibility of the whole chain. They know what's one step behind them, one step forward, but um, it's just really hard to establish what's going on. And this has shown uh, quite many problems uh, over over the past decades uh, from, from the food industry where we had uh, counterfeit, uh, 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 actually fake meat uh, and, and fake, all kinds of fake, fake products. Um, I'm sure everyone's heard of, of the scandals uh, that were also happening with horse meat, uh, but also in other supply chains, really, it's not really limited to, to food supply chains. And um, so I'm, I'm going all the way back from, from, from the actual problem in the world to try to attach it to the problem in the, in the technology. So I'll get, get to the tech very soon, but just so really quickly to reiterate, the idea here is that you have a bunch of companies, a very decentralized scenario, and they all have some data. They have a data silo, uh, essentially, something, some system that they already use. Maybe they've been using it for, for decades, who knows, but it's usually some ERP system or sometimes it's even a spreadsheet or whatever. And you have all this data scattered all around. Uh, and no one really has one place to look at it. So ideally, um, you would have a, a database or some sort to, you know, be able to see what's what's going on, uh, and that can enable all kinds of applications. And I'll mention, I'll show some of them today. Um, but basically, there are tons of underlying smaller challenges here. Smaller, they're pretty big by themselves. It's just the whole uh, problem is is quite quite big. Actually, the problem. Uh, Turns out that, that a third of supply chain executives cannot uh, guarantee, cannot claim that their the ingredients in their food are not fraudulent. So that's a pretty kind of a scary thought that you think that one third of the people that are running our our food systems are are well, they are not sure, and they have the eyes on everything. And the issue comes down to several things, but like one of the things is that I mentioned is very different IT systems, landscapes, even the, the companies that are building these systems are building them in such a way so that they are centralized. So that if you buy something from that company X, um, then if you want to upgrade, you would need to buy the other thing from company X again. So you're kind of locked in and it's called vendor lock-in. Probably most of you have heard of this problem. So there's no really incentive to connect you to another system so easily. It's actually the opposite to close you in. Um, then we have tons of various data models, and then this is uh, actually, you know, taken into kind of a, a good, uh, um, uh, the, the good approach there is to standardize data models and actually get standards on, on how you, you know, uh, handle data. But also then there's the issue of how many companies have implemented the standards and to what degree and so on. Finally, you have trust issues in the, in the chain. So, um, you know, sharing information on, let's say, let's say if we could do it on a public ledger, not, not only that the company would not be happy to share uh, sensitive information on, on, let's say, Ethereum, for example, because, well, then everybody uh, and their competitors could be, uh, you know, well, somehow using this information against them, but also, um, also for issues that uh, even if you could share it point to point to a certain partner, you, it's, it's not... Uh, it's not your business or your holding company or whatever. So there's, there's quite a few trust issues there. Uh, and then especially the trust issue is very strong when you don't know who your partner is. So someone down the chain, let's say in China, which we're pretty much all aware of right now that there's quite a few supply chain issues because of the whole coronavirus situation. You just don't know where some things come from uh, quite often. And that's, um, that's, that's really, it's really hard to trust someone you don't know. Um, so these are just some some high level uh, industry challenges when it comes to supply chain data share. Um, so what have we done? We have started, actually started in 2011 as a student project, but 2013 we'd opened up the company and uh, we've operated in Europe. Mostly we worked on food traceability and we basically built centralized supply chain uh, solutions. So it was um, the, the core data, um, uh, the core data storage and, and basically management uh, system was SQL based. 
and uh, and we worked with that uh, on uh, dairy use cases, poultry use cases at the time. We had a wine use case as well. So we were growing, and um, and actually what we really specifically focused on uh, focused on was the supply chain data standard, which was called it's, it's called EPCIS, uh, GS1 EPCIS, and uh, essentially it explains four core uh, Ws. That's how they call them. What was handled, uh, where was it handled, and when and why. So kind of, uh, uh, and obviously the fifth one is who. Uh, that's kind of semi governed by the standard, but essentially it, uh, it's it's all these things that you need to answer to know what happened along uh, a certain supply chain with some object. And and actually along the way we we worked uh, we we uh, we were part of several programs. One of them was even with Walmart in. in Beijing in China, where we got the Food Safety Innovation Award. But the, kind of the problem where we ran into now was kind of a different problem of um, we could show data, we could show uh, we were perfectly fine with a centralized solution. You could store tons of things in a SQL database. The problem is that it's centralized. So we got a lot of these questions about why should anyone trust us as a startup that we hold this data and show it to someone when we can you know, um, manipulate it, just to be blunt, uh, even though we didn't do that. But push come to shove, that could have happened. Um, and uh, the, the narrative was, and I totally agree with it, that uh, a larger supply chain player and a small startup in such a way of the system being built uh, cannot guarantee trust in this data because we can always be kind of pushed by the, the big guys, right? So for us, blockchain made a lot of sense. We started... Uh, actually in 2017, and uh, we did some first experiments in, in POCs, quickly realized that we need, uh, that we cannot put all the data on the chain, and that, that's actually quite a bit of data. But also from the experience before, we realized that uh, one key component that we were using, um, and we realized it when we hit the pain point of SQL, really, is that we were essentially emulating graphs inside of a SQL database. So we had a kind of a huge, um, you know, table where you had all these entities and then entity connections on the side, basically edges and vertices. And then you would have a kind of a, a the longer the chain, you kind of had a weird growing join situation where there was a join after a join and that in a while it becomes actually problematic and expensive. So we, we realized that um, a really good combination of what we already were doing, and that was really emulating graphs, but it, obviously not doing that in, in a, a SQL database, but something more tailored with blockchain that could give integrity to this graph was something that we could, uh, we could actually um, deploy across all kinds of supply chains where we would remove this problem that we are some sort of a middleman holding the data so we're no longer there to to get to to uh, have any sort of issue uh, on that end, and that's why we spawned the uh, the actual Origin Trail decentralized network, which operates on the Origin Trail protocol. So these nodes, I'll explain a bit further how they work, uh, are essentially there to hold a decentralized knowledge graph. Uh, so a bit of a specific situation when it comes to off-chain data storage and, man and uh, management and sharing. And where we're heading to today is actually we're building uh, another product, which is called the Network Operating System, or NOS. The idea with NOS is to, and by the way, Origin Trail is completely open source. NOS is, is our company product where we help other companies on board. So essentially connect their systems with either the Origin Trail network or Ethereum or even other, uh, for example, Hyperledger. Uh, ecosystems because one of our partners actually Oracle where we worked uh, together with them on, on a certain uh, set of different uh, pilots uh, in within the hyperledger space um, where the idea actually that origin trail is able to help observe these systems as well as certain data sources so I'll try to explain that on on one of the next slides but um, really briefly just to, to touch upon what the origin trail ecosystem is about, um, we, we really um, try to emphasize this because we, we believe it's 
um, the most important thing, and that's why we went into into such an endeavor, is that there's actually three key things that we're trying to achieve. We want to stay neutral, so that's why one of the key pillars of the ecosystem is to be neutral. That's why the technology is open source, uh, and it uh, it should not favor any sort of vendor, uh, any sort of uh, different implementation. And in that sense, uh, we're trying to build it in such a way that it doesn't even uh, necessarily favor a specific um, a blockchain, so that you can actually uh, take it and implement it with another blockchain if uh, if you see fit. So um, in a way, blockchain agnostic. But also um, the the problem I mentioned uh, regarding you know just the business side of adoption was that uh, well not only that, that uh, making a centralized system was one. The other one was how do we connect these parties to work together? And uh, that's where inclusiveness comes in. So we spawned uh, actually an organization, which is a business organization called Trace Alliance, where the idea is to uh, try and, uh, and get as many of these parties and supply chains collaborating together without changing the way they work. So not ripping and replacing their systems. And then finally, uh, making all this usable. I think one of the, the, the kind of the, the key issues we've all seen in, in the space is that we've been, it's really hard to build decentralized systems and we're still stuck in some problems, especially, especially scalability. We're not, I don't believe that many companies are devoted, have devoted their attention and energy to usability. So the idea here uh, of Trace Labs and the network operating system is to help companies really you know, build uh, easier uh, and, and use this technology today rather than in five years when we have, I don't know, X amount of transactions per second we can do because we're not really waiting for that. Uh, we, we are waiting for blockchain and the whole decentralized space to show to show really concrete value. And, uh, and, and that's for people in the businesses that I speak to still kind of very hard to pinpoint. Uh, they understand some of the, some of the concepts mostly, but quite often it's not really usable enough, and that's okay. The technology is, in my opinion, is is kind of a, uh, and I don't, I don't want this to sound weird, but a kind of a lower lower level um, uh, technology where we um, really utilize it so that the end user doesn't necessarily always have to be aware of it, uh, but it, that it can prove uh, and give value too. And quite often I try to give an, a, a kind of an analogy that not that many people understand HTTP, which is a protocol, right? But uh, but we all use it every day. So it's probably going to be the way to adoption is probably going to look like that. It's not going to look like uh, my, you know, everybody understanding, you know, rollups and transactions and ZK proofs and all these amazing things, which I'm really a big fan of. Uh, but I, I know how blank the faces can look like when I start explaining that to people. So, so, uh, but really quickly, the neutrality, inclusiveness, and usability are three key things we're focusing on trying to build something. So if you're building a supply chain application and only one company uses it, then it's not really proving its, its value. So the decentralization makes sense only in an environment where you have a lot of companies collaborating together, changing data, using the, the trust of the protocols that connect them and actually having usable applications. And in order to do this, you have to be neutral. You cannot be another, a big vendor that uh, everyone's gonna come to. It's, it's never happened. So I'll try to focus on the tech now, what Origin Trail really does and try, I'll try to, to, to be short. Uh, but essentially it's a, it's a network that's bit, built off chain. So, uh, we, we like to say that it uses blockchain for the consensus layer. So essentially, uh, whatever needs consensus happens on the chain. Um, and then the data stays off chain in a, basically a decentralized graph database. So uh, every node has its own database. So it's not a, it's a bit of a different thing that uh, some people ask me, for example, how does it compare to BigchainDB? Uh, and um, as BigchainDB is a very interesting technology, it kind of has a, um, consensus element to it, let's say, uh, where origin trail doesn't. So the idea is that everyone, uh, it's more like swarm in that regard. Uh, but the difference is that instead of, um, you know, uh, having a bunch of uh, chunks of, of data dispersed on the network, we're actually looking at it from a different perspective and 
joining the data into a huge graph um, that you can actually verify. Um, and so basically each data set that comes onto the network and kind of the core unit is not a transaction, but really a publishing of a data set, the data set uh, gets understood to a certain degree uh, so that it can be fit into a graph and connected with other data. Uh, so essentially it's, it's a, a growing knowledge graph of interconnected data. And the idea there is to build it so it's interoperable um, and that, that basically works with technologies that are already there. So we're not changing anything uh, that the companies are already using. So if they're using an SAP ERP, that's fine. Uh, Oracle works too. And then just uh, in, the, in the middle, it kind of positions itself as a, as a middleware between these, these things. Um, the network itself is a peer-to-peer -peer network. So it's actually built on a Kademlia overlay. And then finally, obviously, uh, applications can be built on top. Pretty much, uh, I think everyone should, should kind of uh, be aware of that already. Um, and basically, the, the handling of the data, like I mentioned, is done through a decentralized knowledge graph. So what we really look at is that everything is a graph. Uh, so we're taking the link data first approach. So that means that basically, the, the core data format on the network is a generic JSON-LD uh, data model that can handle multiple standards. So you take a relatively flexible approach where you can fit in multiple data models. Uh, so uh, right, schemaless in a way. Uh, yet again, in order to be able to understand at least some of it, you have to have some structure. And the main things there are uh, supply chain identifiers. So you need to have something that is an identity ideally a uh, decentralized identity or DID, but supply chains are far from it. So they were still using barcodes and things like that. Uh, those identifiers are, are one of the, 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 the key things we've built a technology around. And then the data attached to it, which I'll explain a bit further how, but essentially if you look at the graph on the right, if you're looking at the screen, uh, you see a kind of a four level approach. So the external level would be the data that already exists in its own models. And for example, GS1 EPCS is the one that I mentioned. WOT is actually a kind of a, an overarching web of things standard, which stands for IoT collected data or pretty much any other thing. You would put this in something we call the OT JSON, which is really the JSON LD uh, that, that represents this in a graph already. Uh, and at an internal level, this would get uh, separated in metadata and graph data, and then finally you would store it in a graph database. And uh, at this point in time, the, the client we're developing utilizes an open source Rango DB because it's a multi-model graph database, but it can use pretty much anything in the data layer, so anyone can, can uh, change it. Uh, and what's re it's really uh, specifically tailored around is something called verifiable credentials data model. Uh, they've been an upcoming data model uh, lately in the space, and, but um, I'll explain a bit further how they work. So I also put that in the presentation. Um, the key thing there is that we're talking about data sets that get converted into graphs and then connected. So what uh, origin trail enables is something called the trustless connector. Essentially that these parties, if they know each other, uh, they can basically cryptographically sign uh, these data sets in such a way that they explain that I'm expecting to receive something from someone and that's, that someone is expecting to get a data set from me so you can get this interlock uh, according to the verifiable credentials data model, essentially, so that, that you're able to attach things to the graph that, that, that should be attached and not that someone can, you know, uh, add some sort of um, information into the graph that doesn't fit um, or, or that should not be there. Someone, uh, let's say, uh, claiming that they're somewhere else. Uh, so what, what the, the idea here is that you get basically a query. You can, you can do a graph traversal of all historical data of a specific supply chain object per event. So that means I pick up my, I don't know, can of beer and I can uh, find the identifiers on it. Sometimes it can be a barcode or a QR or whatever it is. I'm able to query the, the, the old information that all the companies have shared on it. And this goes both in a public scenario as well as in a permission scenario because some of this data might not be published on the network, but you could maybe purchase it from someone who is listening on the network. So I'll mention that a bit uh, a bit further. So if this all sounds familiar, it actually sounds a lot like the semantic web. 
uh, and uh, really quickly, I'm, I'm just I put this graph here to um, reiterate what it was supposed to be. Uh, and I'm uh, sure there's quite a few opinions about it, but uh, a lot of people seem to think that semantic web was, uh, well, uh, didn't happen for various reasons. Um, I think it's a really good idea. And actually a lot of these concepts are covered with the origin trail protocol. What I do want to kind of emphasize, I believe that wasn't available until now that blockchain and the space can bring is really the, the upper, the, the top layer, which we see here is the trust, which was hard to establish, uh, especially in a real world com uh, scenario of, uh, of uh, something like a supply chain. So essentially it's really a lot like a semantic web uh, approach. Really quickly, what the verifiable credential is basically is, is a situation where we have someone issuing some claim, or in this case, a data set. We're taking it a little broader than just a credential uh, to a holder. A holder can be one person or maybe a whole network. And then anyone as a verifier can go and check, check this uh, issued credential claim according to the cryptographic proofs and uh, when required. So this works really well uh for uh with with the decentralized identity as a standard but not to go too deep into it i'll try to explain really quickly the verifiable credentials and the graph behind them so this is a kind of a generic very simple example of verifiable credential data model i took it directly from from the standard so it's not the best example maybe in this case as i'm speaking on supply chains but essentially i think you guys will get it it's very simple so it's, it has three elements. So the, the metadata, which is presented in pink, the claims, which are yellow, and the proofs, which are green. And essentially, it's a credential graph. So we see that this is a credential for a certain alumni of the example or university. Uh, so if we observe data in this aspect, and then finally, obviously, a proof graph underneath with the signature and what type it is and then when it was made. Uh, we can always kind of look at every claim in the supply chain in this way. A certain company claimed something happened and here's a proof. And then you can all put it in a, in a pretty big graph and you can actually aggregate a lot of these claims so that once you have a very long, very big file of what has been going on, let's say in your warehouse and it's like 10 megabytes, when you publish it to the origin trail decentralized network, um, this data gets replicated around the network in a certain uh, network specific way, which I, I, I'm not going to go too deep into, but essentially involves uh, the nodes being incentivized for storing the data. And then um, what happens is that uh, this data set gets fingerprinted on the chain and a certain uh, smart contract, let's say, has the ability to, to govern the relations between these nodes that are holding the data and tokens that they're supposed to receive uh, for, for this work. Additionally, what it does is that if someone were to sell a, a non-public, non-replicated data set through the network, they would be able to be ensured that, for example, if they were to sell a certain claim uh, to someone for a certain amount of tokens, that if they were to send the claim in its original form, which can be proven because it, they're in the verifiable credential model, um, if they send the claim in the original form, they will uh, definitely get tokens uh, and vice versa. If I'm sending tokens to purchase a certain data set, I will definitely get the, the data in the original form. And that's where we implemented the MVP actually uh, algorithm in, uh, in a smart contract based on uh, something called a sw fair swap protocol uh, designed by uh, the Technical University of Dar Darmstadt. Um, but I'll go, I won't go there. Uh, I'll try to explain really quickly. So this, the idea there is that we have a verifiable pre presentation that's derived from a verifiable, and in this case, credential, because it's intended to be used mostly for credentials, but the older name for the standard is really verifiable claims. And for, for us, that fits the purpose really well. Um, the verifiable claims, therefore, means that uh, basically we can take a part of this graph and we can verify that it's true, obviously using a Merkle tree-like proof um, and, and because we have a, a, pro, a, a big finger, a fingerprint of the big data set of the huge graph somewhere on, on, on some chain. So that's what origin trail kind of in a nutshell does. And what that means for supply chain is if you go to a store, and this is an example from Slovenia, you would scan a bar of QR code actually. It's not really a special code, it just takes you to a website. 
where you can input the expiry date and an LOT number of the piece of chicken you actually took in your hand. And you'll see the actual complete trail of what uh, has happened to it, uh, from which farm it came and, and what type of events happened in the supply chain. And in the end, uh, the, where you bought it. So basically all the information shared in between. Um, another case where we've implemented, uh, and this is by the way, in production live for, for, for a while already. So uh, Slovenian customers and, and customers in uh, Austria uh, and Southeastern Europe can actually do this with, with the poultry uh, of the producer I showed. Uh, the other, one of the other use cases that, that ties in very well is the actually with our partners from BSI, which is the British Standards Institute, where they essentially issue verifiable uh, training certificates for for auditors and business standards. And, and so the idea there is that you can take this certificate and observe it as, okay, one data set, but you can connect it to other things that have been happening in the supply chain. For example, a certificate that a certain food is organic, uh, which is quite often a, a kind of a challenge. Um, and then if you connect this certificate, this data claim with the uh, origin or the verifiable trail that's actually changing on a daily basis for every single product, you, you get um, you get the ability of just attaching things together and getting the whole story uh, in a trusted way and verifying it using the Ethereum smart contracts. Um, so in that sense, what happens here is in supply chains, we're really just kind of, it's growing in terms of data. There's, there's tons of things happening and um, uh, it, even something like uh, algorithm councils being formed. This is uh, something being proposed by the Digital Supply Chain Institute, uh, which uh, we've also worked with together. But basically they say there's gonna to be tons of data that we need to trust and we need to somehow handle uh, in an intelligent way. And uh, the promising way seems to be kind of like the way uh, other uh, technologies have been approaching it is from the, the linked data perspective. Uh, so that's why we're, this is the approach we're taking. We're, we're taking the, I'm sure you've seen this pyramid before, but the approach uh, that uh, we are trying to, to work towards these problems with is that we're using trust as an element on layer two in this pyramid to give data that comes from various systems uh, integrity and then also structure. And that's what Origin Trail is about. We, we basically get to the point where we can connect this so that we can provide knowledge to the customers or, or companies that, that, are, that are willing to build on top of such systems uh, in order to achieve something that would ideally be a world that we could call a Google for supply chains and not the Google in the uh, bad company centralized Google way, more of an autonomous supply chain decentralized knowledge graph scenario where everyone gets to participate and exchange the information um, through their part of the graph and on the part that they see. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically kind of what we've been doing and how we've been approaching the problem. Spot on. I love the separation of off-chain data and, and, and using the on-chain stuff where it's important. And I love the philosophical space and the, the social space that you're coming from. I am so honored to have you here joining us in our first virtual conference, Ben. I'm very honored to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, uh, once again, uh, have, uh, have a great rest of the conference. I'll stay here. I'll, uh, I'll listen in. Cool. Uh, yeah. Would, uh, give me a link to your slides um, and as so that we can post it with the YouTube channel uh, edited talk and also any other links to resources that it is that you want to have uh, linked on the on the talk when it's up on YouTube. Okay, definitely. We'll have that. Thank you very much. Oh, man.